Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this um, presentation tonight and a special welcome to those of us who are joining us from Kalamazoo College. My name is Jennifer Cooley and I'm the Director of Museum Education here at the KIA and we are delighted to continue a partnership developed in 2018 with Kalamazoo College's Department of Art and Art History that has allowed us to jointly offer the postdoctoral fellowship. This fellowship is granted to talented scholars who have recently earned doctoral degrees in art history and related fields. It's designed to simultaneously diversify and expand the art history curriculum at Kalamazoo College while building increased curatorial capacity at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Postdoctoral fellows serve as key members of the collections and exhibitions team here at the KIA while also teaching courses at Kalamazoo College. Previous fellows have gone on to careers at the Speed Museum of Art and the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. During the summer of 2023, we were pleased to welcome our third postdoctoral fellow, James Dennison. A native of the DC area and a graduate of Bowdoin College, James recently completed his PhD in art history at the University of Michigan where he wrote a thesis on the connections between the Stieglitz Circle and racism in the interwar US. This evening, he offers an, ex an examination of Georgia O'Keeffe's New Mexican paintings and what they reveal about the artist's engagement with South Southwestern indigenous cultures. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones. And now please welcome me and joining Dr. James Dunnison. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, everyone, um, for being here and for following along online. Um, it's great to be able to uh, share some of my research with you all, so thanks. Um, and before I begin, I also want to thank uh, Kate College and the KIA for co-sponsoring this talk and uh, Miriam Thomas for facilitating it. So. George O'Keefe arrived in New Mexico in late April 1929 as a mature artist. Under her husband Alfred Stieglitz's promotion, she had grown famous for her close-up flower paintings and New York cityscapes, receiving significant praise from pro-modernist critics beginning in the early 1920s. By the spring of 1929, she was in search of personal and creative independence from Stieglitz's New York orbit, and with the encouragement of friends who had spoken glowingly of the place, she set out for northern New Mexico alongside her close friend and fellow artist, Beck Strand. Almost the first thing that the pair did the day after their arrival was attend an annual corn dance at nearby San Felipe Pueblo. While there, they ran into arts patron Mabel Lujan, who was attending the dance with her husband, Taos Pueblo tribe member Tony Lujan. Mabel, who knew O'Keefe and Strand from New York, immediately invited them to attend another dance near Taos and to stay at her expansive ranch there. Where she, had, where she had been supporting a literary and artist colony for several years. O'Keefe stayed the entire summer, and while there, not only advanced her work, but also socialized with the community of artists, writers, and other intellectuals that gathered at the ranch and elsewhere throughout Taos. She also made numerous trips in the company of these new friends to sites of aesthetic and cultural interest in the region, including a camping trip to the Taos Indian Reservation, a visit to see the ancient ancestral Pueblo and cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde, a tour across Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah that incorporated visits to several Navajo sites and multiple trips to further Pueblo dances. And I'll note now that for the most part in my presentation, I'll use the more correct term for the so-called Navajo, which is Diné. O'Keefe also produced her first New Mexican paintings. Uh oh, there we go also produced her first New Mexican paintings that summer. By 1929, O'Keefe was established as an artist whose work blended figuration and abstraction, often through the simplification of visually complex places and things into a blend of angular and curved lines describing planes of color. Abst abstraction seeped into her work through her simplifying tendencies. Objects and locations were divorced from context and stripped of complexities, but held up as spiritually resonant and visually meaningful in reaction to O'Keefe's emotional feelings um, about the overwhelming experience of the region's grandeur and the influence of modernist interests, aspirations, and expectations. As these pictures suggest, for O'Keefe in the late 1920s, 
Part of the Southwest's attraction was not only the prospect of encountering new visual stimuli that could lead her painting in new directions, but also the possibility of discovering people, places, and things whose inner character she could depict in a semi-abstract modernist practice that combined visual selection, description, and distortion with expressionism. She wrote to Stieglitz soon after arriving in Taos in 1929, quote, this really isn't like anything you ever saw. It's no use to try to tell you what the country feels like, unquote. Alongside the Southwest's pleasant climate and natural beauty, a central component of what lured metropolitan elites to New Mexico was a tourist trade fixated on the cultural character of its indigenous and Hispanic communities. The most famous and powerful entity in shaping understandings of New Mexico among members of American metropolitan high society in the early 20th century was the Fred Harvey Company, a tourist outfit that focused on offering wealthy East Coasters opportunities to experience a distorted version of Native American cultures through craft markets, ethnographic displays, and so-called Indian detours that brought the tourists directly to indigenous ruins, pueblos, and picturesque natural sites. That O'Keefe stayed in Harvey hotels, traveled on the Harvey-partnered Santa Fe Railway's chief line, wrote letters on its chieftain logoed stationery, and attended indigenous dances, races, rodeos, and markets during her 1929 trip, suggests that her early visits to New Mexico included substantial participation in mainstream tourist activities. It is telling that Indian detours also included activities that seemingly had little to do with Native Americans, including visits to scenic vistas and white artist communities. In a way, everything of interest to the tourist in New Mexico was connected to the central attraction, the state's picturesque and exotic Native Americans. In the tourism experiences offered by Harvey, virtually every site to be seen was native themed, from female tour guides who wore Navajo costumes to the train cars and hotel spaces in which guests were housed. These companies often fixated upon the supposed timelessness of the region's indigenous cultures, which were offered up as living ruins from the past, an attitude that led guide companies to present modern inhabited pueblos and ancient Pueblo and sites like Mesa Verde to visitors with little differentiation. From the moment of her arrival in Santa Fe, O'Keefe would have been hard pressed to avoid this tourist industry. Indeed, she seems to have embraced it with enthusiasm, at least at first. O'Keefe's views of New Mexico were also shaped by experiences particular to the state's modernist social milieu. As one historian describes it, quote, American modernists desired to break down the political, social, and moral disorder of Anglo civilization, and the physical and cultural landscapes of New Mexico seem to have most of the requisite attributes to create a modern American culture that would cure the malaise of modernity." Unquote. Within the Taos community, a greater familiarity with an augmented sense of affection and admiration for the local indigenous and Hispanic communities led to a somewhat different form of exotification from that practiced and celebrated by the Harvey Company and the short-term tourist set, for whom Southwestern native cultures were just one of many exotic spectacles waiting to be experienced across the country or around the world. For those who returned to the state repeatedly or moved there permanently like O'Keefe, comfortable exoticism was often complicated by a more intense form of admiration for Native and Hispanic groups, or even a desire to emulate or assimilate into those groups in order to absorb some of the beneficial aspects of their character. Perhaps, these modernists felt, deeper investment in the life ways of New Mexico's non-white peoples could provide Euro-Americans with the spiritual and cultural direction that they so desperately needed. As so often seems to be the case among avant-garde from across the world, the cultural renewal and supposed authenticity of experience that New Mexican modernists thought uh, seemed to always rely on the appropriation and exploitation of non-white cultures. In many cases, coastal elites who made regular visits to New Mexico or adopted it as their home, including several of O'Keefe's close friends, assumed an attitude of superiority to or disdain for the attitudes and practices commonly seen within the tourist sphere. Some art critics also made complaints about the insubstantiality of tourist perceptions of Southwestern cultures and viewed O'Keeffe's work as a welcome corrective to the problem. O'Keeffe eventually developed such an attitude of superiority herself, one that led her to not only isolate herself from the state's tourism hubs, but also to increasingly believe in the rarity of her own ability to understand the inner character of its lands and peoples. Whereas the supposedly primitive or timeless character of indigenous Southwesterners helped them function as curiosities for tourists, 
For modernists, it offered a sense of profundity and truth in a shallow and corrupted world. Meanwhile, the exotic character and simplicity of native designs also offered modernists a new path forward aesthetically. O'Keeffe's own, fa own fascination with supposedly primitive groups and dissatisfaction with the conditions of modern urban living is suggested in a 1937 letter she wrote after a visit to New York's Museum of Natural History. Quote, there's something so real, true, about some of the primitive art. I feel so surely that civilization destroys anything that might be big or real in us, unquote. In 1951, she wrote during a trip to Mexico City that, quote, things that were done before the Spaniards got here will outlast it all. Our civilization doesn't seem to improve anything, unquote. Right scholar Brenda Mitchell, O'Keefe was a modern romantic, emphasizing individual experience and intensified emotional responses and pictures that positioned her as a clairvoyant artist representing the true essence of her subject." Unquote. For such an artist, the supposed heightened spirituality of New Mexico lent the state an appeal that few others could match. Writes art historian Sharon Udall about New Mexico, quote, "...the aura of the Southwest continues to lure and fascinate, as if emanating from the sky, rocks, sun, and earth, an ageless force compels but at the same time eludes interpretation." Unquote. New Mexico offered the opportunity to represent places and things that retained the mystery of the mystical. Communing with the state's supposed primitive, authentic, and naturally connected indigenous and Hispanic communities was key to the appeal. O'Keeffe's works were both oriented towards the elite urban audiences of the East Coast and informed by the Manhattan milieu that she lived and worked within from the 1900s through the 1940s. According to art historian Jackson Rushing, quote, Numerous American artists, anthropologists, collectors, and writers were discovering Native American art after World War I, resulting in numerous exhibitions and publications." Unquote. In addition to regionalist novels and articles on Native American culture and modernist journals, O'Keeffe was also exposed to romantic and idyllic notions of the Southwest in conversation with her numerous friends from the Manhattan art world who had previously visited there. Naturally, after her 1929 arrival, O'Keeffe's perspectives on New Mexico's indigenous and Hispanic peoples were no longer shaped only by their representations in popular culture or the accounts of friends, but also by her own interactions with them, and especially her relationship with Tony Lujan. In 1931, she described Lujan to, Hunt, to a friend as intuitively attuned to the natural world, an Indian who is one of the most remarkable people I have ever known. Wonderful to me like a mountain is wonderful, or the sky is wonderful. Such an uncanny sense of life and human ways, such a child and such a man at the same time. Despite the amazement she felt at his unfamiliar ways, she and Tony did share a substantive and affectionate friendship. O'Keefe wrote in 1929 that, quote, Tony seems to pull out the best things that are in me, unquote. Though the pair became friends soon after her arrival in 1929, Substantive interactions with other non-white New Mexicans were limited for O'Keefe, even after her 1949 move to the small, predominantly Hispanic village of Abiquiu. On early visits, she did meet other Puebloans through Tony or other friends, but seemed to principally view them as exotic and foreign. Most of her interactions with people of indigenous and Hispanic descent were colored by class as well as racial divisions. After purchasing her property in Abiquiu in the mid-1940s, she met many townspeople, often after hiring them as construction or domestic workers, but frequently took on a condescending and paternalistic attitude towards them. She was often befuddled by what she considered to be their strange and backward ways. According to a friend, she once said to the locals, quote, I don't know anything about these people, unquote. The course of O'Keefe's relationship with the state may have been idiosyncratic given her decision to physically isolate herself from most of her modernist peers by living at Ghost Ranch, the former dude ranch that she purchased in 1940, and in nearby Abiquiu, where she moved nine years later. And you can see Abiquiu made far too large there on the map. Um, it's a tiny, tiny town. Um, Consequently, scholars have debated just how much O'Keeffe knew about the indigenous and Hispanic subjects that she featured in her paintings. However, ultimately, more so than any approach towards a particular subject or topic, what O'Keeffe seemed to absorb from the tourist and modernist context that so heavily informed her experience of and interest in the Southwest was a confidence that her own perspective on the region 
including all of the sites and things within it, was adequate. And her subjective interpretation could suffice in the place of learning about and articulating what such subjects meant to the groups whose exoticism seemed to lend them so much of their appeal. When O'Keefe foregrounded her own subjectivity as she approached these subjects, she revealed her complicity in far longer and broader settler practices in New Mexico that normalized appropriation and exploitation of the region's non-white cultures. Though they are related by the shared social, intellectual, personal, and artistic context that surround O'Keeffe's initial visits to New Mexico in 1929, 1930, and 1931, the various subjects that O'Keeffe painted during these early trips to the state demonstrate the influence of those contexts in diverse ways. Some works, like her pictures of adobe churches or her painting of Taos Pueblo, represent buildings that were among the region's most popular tourist sites and were therefore natural points of interest for new artists seeking to understand or convey the state's character. The north side structure at Taos Pueblo, for example, which is the artwork at the top right, was featured with frequency and prominence in the art and tourist materials of the period. Indeed, the building has long been, quote, one of the most photographed and painted architectural structures in North America, unquote. The San Francisco de Assis Church, which O'Keeffe pictured 10 times in 1929 and 1930, was also a site that virtually always merited mention in tourist guidebooks. Both O'Keeffe's pictures and her written comments about them emphasize her interest in their formal qualities. For example, when she wrote to Stieglitz about her Rancho's church paintings, she took care to stress her interest in its unusual shape and color. Quote, I am painting the back of an old church. It is the queerest shape you ever saw, sand color against a blue sky. This interest is clearly manifested in the spare simplicity of certain of these pictures, most of which show little more than brown brick, blue sky, and white cloud as they picture the building from its unostentatious rear. Meanwhile, her painting of the Pueblo showcases not just an attention to detail, but also an interest in the structure's irregular smooth angularity and the visual effect of its brown form standing against the blue sky, seemingly emanating naturally from the land. Though foregrounding the site's aesthetic qualities arguably frees them from the ethnographic meanings that earlier portrayals had layered upon them, there seems to be only there seems to only be room in these paintings for what O'Keefe finds O'Keefe finds interesting about the buildings, that is, their form and supposed spiritual power, rather than their actual religious, cultural, and practical significance within the communities that they were built to serve. Whereas earlier artists had used these distinctive buildings to suggest the authenticity of their scenes to the audience to audiences through evocative detail, much as they use the bright patterned clothes in which they often dress native protagonists, O'Keefe's spare scenes of the same structures emphasize the buildings themselves and feature no human forms, recognizably indigenous or otherwise. Indeed, they are typical of O'Keefe's style, smooth and simplified, with a tendency towards erasure of surface detail, but a careful incorporation of the formal elements of the buildings themselves. This attention to the form of the buildings is only heightened by her tendency for close cropping, at times to the point of fragmentation and monumentalization. O'Keefe's pictures of adobe buildings face either the front or the back of the edifices directly, often making parts of the structures seem two-dimensional. In comparison to picturesque works like Ernest Blumenshine's Church at Rancho de Taos, O'Keefe's pictures seem coolly observational suggesting an interest in the combination of flat and curved lines, planes, and masses in the adobe structures they picture, as much or more than any exotic fascination with the people who erected them. However, it would have been quite difficult for O'Keeffe's paintings to completely sidestep the exotification inherent in the paintings and tourist materials that had made those sites famous. After all, what had driven O'Keeffe not just to New Mexico, but to these particular sites in the first place? Brenda Mitchell writes, quote, the pervasive spirituality of the Pueblo culture played an important role in O'Keeffe's interest in these structures, unquote. And it is interesting that O'Keeffe chose to represent San Francisco, de, San Francisco de Assis in particular, rather than one of the many other mission churches whose designs might seem less simple, natural, or less simple or natural than the massive earthen form of San Francisco de Assis's apse, which is what we see from behind here in the left-hand image. In O'Keeffe's hands, as the church and the Pueblo structure's forms emanate starkly from the ground, and in certain cases have their edges surrounded by a sharp glowing halo of white against blue sky, seemingly humming with spiritual power, 
They acknowledge and celebrate both form and spirit. Though the rounded angularity of adobe structures fit in well with O'Keeffe's pre-existing style, when her pictures of such buildings aestheticized and spiritualized them through the lens of modernism, they also, in a sense, thereby misinterpreted them by divorcing them of their meaning within the cultures that produced them. In their vague invocation of indigenous and Catholic spirituality, they played into the fascination with the foreign uh, spirituality of the region's non-white peoples. O'Keeffe's fascination with indigenous architectures was made even more clear in a 1945 letter in which she wrote of a desire to, direct, to erect a hogan, which is a traditional Diné dwelling, at her ghost ranch house. Though we can imagine that a hogan might have appealed to her desire for authentic indigeneity, it is unclear exactly why she wanted it. Certainly, it would not have been a comfortable home for someone like O'Keeffe, who was accustomed to the stylishness and conveniences of most 20th century American homes. This episode is suggestive of the degree to which Native cultures became central to the sense of escape that O'Keeffe found in the state, for she moved there permanently in 1949. Tellingly, in 1947, as she struggled, struggled to settle Stieglitz's estate in New York after his death, she described her mounting longing for New Mexico as becoming, quote, more and more Hogan-minded, unquote. These adobe church paintings also speak to O'Keeffe's fascination with Catholic and indigenous religions in New Mexico. Her interest in the lingering influence of Spanish Catholicism in the state was displayed overtly in the five images of crosses towering over the New Mexican landscape that she also produced during her 1929 visit. In her 1976 book, O'Keeffe writes that she, quote, saw the crosses so often, like a thin dark veil of the Catholic church spread over the New Mexico landscape. For me, painting the crosses was a way of painting the country, unquote. Her interest in religion often manifested itself through her longstanding appreciation of indigenous dance ceremonies. Over the decades she spent in New Mexico, O'Keeffe attended such ceremonies on a regular basis. In some cases, these dances were public spectacles attended by many tourists. However, as time passed, O'Keeffe increasingly preferred to attend ceremonies in remote communities in which she and her friends were the only non-native guests. At many of these ceremonies, secret sacred knowledge not intended for dissemination outside the tribe was doubtless communicated. Though she attended dances with lessening frequency as she aged, her great interest in ceremonials made clear by her frequent and enthusiastic discussion of them in correspondence with friends and decades, uh, friends and acquaintances lasting decades. O'Keeffe's interest in indigenous dance ceremonies reflects the broader fascination with them among tourist audiences. Writes dance scholar Jacqueline Shea Murphy, quote, watching authentic Indian dancing was a primary activity of Southwest tourists in the 1920s and 30s, a highlight of the authentic Southwest that they expected to encounter, unquote. O'Keeffe wrote in just her second letter to Stieglitz after arriving in New Mexico in 1929, quote, it is no use to try to tell about an Indian dance. It can't be told any more than I can tell what the country feels like, unquote. In her eyes, these ceremonies were capable of demonstrating the innate bond that Puebloans held with New Mexico's natural world. Given the state's appeal for many Anglos, as uh, white people are often referred to in New Mexico, um, given that the state's appeal for many Anglos was rooted in the supposed connection between its spiritual and cultural character and the land itself, that such ceremonies appealed to her as unsurprising, and her interest directly manifested itself in at least two paintings from 1929 as you can see here. Art historian Sasha Scott's investigation of one of these pictures at the rodeo, which O'Keeffe painted after seeing Tony Lujan and other Puebloans dance in several performances, describes it as O'Keeffe's attempt to convey her experiences of the ceremony spectacle. Scott writes, quote, at the rodeo speaks to her desire to convey her pleasure in the evening's events and the dance's transformative power. The whirling colors suggest a dizzying euphoric feeling. The burning red of the painting abstracts Tony's burning red blanket and the red and black and blue blanket of his partner, as well as the movement of the dancers, unquote. Wrote O'Keefe, quote, it was very perfect, those Indians with their drums, like a heartbeat from the center of the earth. The dance was so beautiful, so terribly alive, unquote. More so even than the many other ways in which O'Keefe consumed Pueblo cultures during her early visits, her attendance at such ceremonies seemed to afford her the mystical and romantic experiences of the place and its non-Anglo cultures that had drawn her there and inspired her after her arrival. 
This fascination may have been flamed by her experiences in 1929, but it carried on throughout her decades in the Southwest, even as her work no longer directly represented Native performances. Instead, as her time in New Mexico went on, O'Keeffe's fascination with local non-white cultures visually manifested itself principally through the lens of objects in some way associated with those cultures, like the earlier wooden virgin. Paintings that reveal this trend feature things that run the gamut from animal parts such as feathers, horns, and bones to finished cultural products like pots, necklaces, and Pueblo uh, so-called spirit dolls. More on that in a minute. More so than any other segment of her work, her still life depictions of these objects reveal O'Keeffe's engagement with subjects of clear spiritual relevance to indigenous and Hispanic groups and her willingness to appropriate holy objects for her own modernist purposes. These still life paintings, which include her famous representations of dried animal bones, trade upon associations between the objects that they picture and the mystique of the Southwest non-white cultures, principally either through allusion to the significance of various animals in those cultures and or direct but decontextualized representation of objects made by those groups. In the case of man-made objects especially, O'Keeffe again has a tendency towards naturalizing the cultural or erasing historical and cultural context in favor of making these things seem natural, timeless, and unchanging, like Native Americans themselves supposedly were. In the case of both natural and man-made things, as they divorce these objects from their cultural significances, these pictures, like many of her architectural and cross paintings, frequently reveal much more about what was fascinating about the Southwest to O'Keeffe and other white Americans than they do about the cultures to which they allude. At the same time, as they demonstrate her move away from painting well-worn tourist sites, these pictures also show the maturation of O'Keeffe's perspective on New Mexico as she moved away from a conventional tourist posture and towards the more knowing but no less essentializing attitude adopted by many Anglo New Mexicans. Ironically, until moving to Abiquiu in 1949, O'Keeffe continued to execute much of her New Mexican still life work while back east during the winter and spring, a strategy that sometimes helped her cope with pangs of Hogan mindedness. In some cases, she would use props shipped from New Mexico, like the bones in cow's skull, red, white, and blue. Indeed, O'Keeffe's avid and long-standing participation in Southwestern Curio Exchange Networks is an underappreciated context for her New Mexican life and work, and reveals the breadth of her connections to Anglo tourist and collector forces, and the depth of her interest in possessing totems of Indianness. The very first day of her 1929 trip included a visit to Santa Fe to peruse so-called Indian pottery. She also sometimes purchased indigenous objects in New York, as when she bought a Diné blanket from a store window in 1942. Her involvement in the curio industry was propelled by her relationships with some of its most influential figures. Her assistant, Maria Chabot, had been the driving force behind the reorganizations of Santa, uh, the reorganization of Santa Fe's Indian markets in the mid-1930s. And her friend, John Condelario, was the owner of a Santa Fe shop known as the Original Old Curio Store. Scholar Stephanie Luthwaite writes that, quote, through the Curio Store, Candelario facilitated O'Keeffe's representation of local artifacts and used O'Keeffe as an intermediary for selling goods, unquote. As time went on, she forewent opportunities to patronize the region's best known shops and markets. Instead, her connections with industry players and continued visits to indigenous settlements and smaller towns closer to Abiquiu gave her ample purchasing opportunities. Visiting or perusing old photographs of O'Keeffe's home in Abiquiu confirms the ardor of her collecting instinct. It is adorned with a mixture of animal skulls, bones, and pelts, rocks, stumps, and native blankets and ceramics alongside modernist sculptures and furniture. Her passion for such things endured, and in 1979, at age 91, she wrote exuberantly about walking around the Santa Fe Plaza looking at Indian treasures. Like most other Anglos in New Mexico, O'Keeffe's interest in these objects was fundamentally driven by a desire to acquire and display them as part of an affectation of Southwestern identity rooted in the region's exotic cultures. Though she did not make a habit of dressing up or dancing in Indian clothes or red face, as some earlier New Mexican artists sometimes had, she may nonetheless have been interested in playing Indian. Art historian Wanda Korn suggests as much about a series of 1931 photographs by Stieglitz in which she wraps herself in a blanket and caresses some of the animal skulls she had sent east as props, and of later photographs in which landscape views 
Western clothes like blue jeans, bandanas, and vaquero hats, and Indian-made jewelry, including Diné necklaces and silver buttons, helped her reinvent herself as a denizen of the high desert in the public eye. Others have argued that O'Keeffe sought to imitate the appearance of Native Americans through sun tanning, such that by the 1940s, quote, O'Keeffe's skin became so tanned that people often believed that she was herself Indian. O'Keeffe enjoyed her aboriginal appearance, which intensified as her face aged and was enhanced by her clothing and long hair, unquote. Painting the things that she collected was an important component of O'Keeffe's personal affectation and creative interpretation and expression of Southwestern identity. And she produced a vast and diverse array of pictures of still life subjects that had resonance with Southwestern indigenous cultures. Without delving too deeply into each of the many types of still lifes that O'Keeffe made in New Mexico, I will suggest that when she painted Native American jewelry and pots, whether made for indigenous use with the tourist market, she revealed her connections to the tourist commodification and distortion of native material cultures. When she depicted turkey feathers, eagle claws, or sheep horns, she ignored the symbolic and spiritual roles that these animals and their body parts played in Pueblo religious traditions, including the ceremonials that she so revered. When she was photographed with and painted a human skull that Candelario brought her, she so showcased a callousness not only towards the life of the skull's original owner, but also likely the sanctity of local Hispanic and indigenous burial traditions, an association that O'Keeffe suggests by painting the skull within a shattered pot. However, if there was one aspect of Native American material culture that seems to have most interested O'Keeffe and that she featured repeatedly as her decades in New Mexico passed, it was the figures called Katsina Titu, often mislabeled or misnamed by white audiences as Kachina dolls, that represent the Hopi sacred entities known as Katsinam. Katsinam, though they play a prominent role in the religious, tra uh, religious traditions of several Pueblo groups, are principally known as the spirit beings of the Hopi world. They are often described as intermediaries or messengers and are beings to whom all Hopi look for direction, heed, and give their prayers for the continuation of life. Residing with the Hopi for half the year, they participate in a variety of ceremonies in which they are embodied by Hopi men in costume. The Katsinam, which are the spirits, carve the Katsina Titu, which are the figures or figurines, um, and during certain ceremonies, give them as gifts, mainly to children. The Titu are not meant to be played with or worshipped, but are instead typically hung on the wall of the family room where they remain as blessings. They are personifications of the Katsinam, often awarded in honor of virtuous behavior or in recognition of special achievements. Many details of both the Katsinam and the Katsina Titu are considered secret and are not intended to be shared even within Hopi society, let alone among external audiences. These care carved figures have a special significance that those without a detailed understanding of Hopi belief systems would be unlikely to grasp. In Hopi eyes, Katsina Titu are not just physical objects or commodities, but animate things with spiritual significance. However, like most Anglo-New Mexicans of her era, there is relatively little evidence that O'Keeffe had any detailed knowledge of Hopi belief, including restrictions around Hopi religious knowledge when she became interested in Katsina Titu. In order to avoid perpetuating the public sharing of representations of objects not intended for external dissemination, I will reproduce only O'Keeffe's painting of a fake Casina Titu in this presentation. However, I will note that she made more than a dozen paintings of these figures, and her interest in representing Casina Titu and other Native American dolls and idols lingered from 1931 all the way into the 1960s. Unlike her dance pictures, indistinct allusions to the movements of Pueblo and celebrants, these Kachina pictures typically feature clear detail with the figure's decoration and distinct fields of color playing into her simplifying style. The figures are often backgrounded by neutral color fields, but in other instances, desert landscapes or closely cropped still life scenes float behind the objects, which are invariably shown close up, even monumentally, and at times so close that only a portion of the full T2 is visible. And you can see here we have what would be an object only a few inches tall towering over a large mountain. The result of these choices is often to make the figures seem wondrous yet strange, potent and materially, decoratively and spiritually complex, and yet inexplicable, elusively elusive, offering as they do little way for an uneducated white audience to make sense of the feathers and string, colors and shapes, wide set eyes and gentle hands of the now giant figures. <laughs> 
O'Keefe isolated these figures, pulling them from the real context in which they might normally have been seen or used. Through these representations of sacred Pueblo objects, O'Keefe risked exposing knowledge that was not intended for external dissemination, and that, when revealed to the uninitiated, could drain certain traditions of their potency. Regardless of what she did or did not know about Katsina, the evidence of her um, correspondence and her pictures of Katsina Titu suggest quite strongly that she viewed them principally through the romantic lens of her Anglo-modernist understanding of the region and its peoples. Though she had earlier stated that she hoped that her pictures would, quote, get to the real meaning of things, unquote, her representations of Katsina Titu seem quite far from that mark. In a 1931 letter, O'Keefe also made clear her fascination with the spiritual character of Katsina Titu. Quote, at the end of my studio is a small Kachina Indian doll with the funny flat feather on its head and its eyes popping out. It has a curious kind of live stillness. When I leave the landscape I work with, these funny things that I now think feel so much like it, unquote. This passage on one hand illustrates the singular lens through which O'Keefe viewed the funny things that she featured in her New Mexican still lifes and the degree to which she linked local material cultures and the New Mexican landscape together in her mind. However, it also suggests the mysteriousness and unfamiliarity that she felt when encountering Katsina Titu. In describing the live stillness that she felt in the object, she seems to signal her personal interest in the spiritual power of such things, one that echoes the spiritual power she found in the bones that she painted, which she had said, quote, cut sharply to the center of something keenly alive in the desert. Ultimately, as this passage suggests, her pictures of Katsina Titu are not just images of simply carved figurines or brightly decorated objects. They are attempts to capture the figure's regionally specific spiritual potency. But they are not much engaged with what these objects or the spirits they represent meant to Puebloans. Instead, they reflect an outsider's lack of understanding of what such objects were or meant. The group of paintings for which O'Keeffe may be best known, her Southwestern landscapes, also revealed the typicality of some of her attitudes towards the region's native communities. However, perhaps more so than any of her other Southwestern works, these pictures of New Mexican land have, negative, uh, have negatively impacted indigenous and Hispanic peoples in the state by declaring, naturalizing, and encouraging their dispossession at the hands of O'Keeffe and other settlers. Though the land stirred something spiritual within her, she did not seem much interested in indigenous beliefs about the land's animate power. In 1930, she wrote that, quote, watching the light and shadow over the desert and mountains all interest me much more than the people. They seem almost not to exist, unquote. The year before, she wrote while looking out over a mountainous landscape, quote, I seem to be hunting for something of myself out there that will give me a symbol for the sense of life I get out here, unquote. O'Keefe evidently had some limited knowledge of the spiritual significance of certain land features to local indigenous communities, even from her earliest days in New Mexico. In a 1929 letter, she mentioned Taos Mountain, which was a sacred site to Taos Pueblones and is pictured in the left-hand picture, um, by referring to it as the Holy Mountain. However, the evidence of her paintings and writings suggests that she had no qualms about using the New Mexican land to her own ends. Instead, she had significant success in encouraging the idea that her favorite painting sites, in some sense, belonged to her. In 1977, O'Keefe remarked while discussing, discussing the New Mexican landscape, quote, when I got to New Mexico, that was mine, unquote. Among the painting sites that O'Keefe most frequently featured in her work was one that she referred to as the Black Place a group of dark hills in northwest New Mexico that are now administered as the Beastie de Nazen Wilderness Area. Between 1936 and 1949, she made more than two dozen pictures there. Letters sent after these visits demonstrate her great admiration for the site, as when she wrote Stieglitz in 1941, waxing lyrical about, quote, those wonderful gray and black hills stretching for miles, unquote. However, O'Keefe knew from the outset that the land that she was painting on while visiting the Black Place was part of Diné territory. Her first three visits all took place on trips during which she also intended, uh, attended Diné ceremonials. O'Keefe and Chabot would often evoke the possibility of visiting the Black Place by referring to potential trips to the Navajo country. And on the way there, the two passed numerous Diné hogans. Right scholar Alicia Inez Guzman, quote, O'Keefe's black place was not truly hers, but historically part of the Diné ancestral lands, unquote. 
The ancestral region that she refers to retains a particular significance because it is the site of the Diné nation's beginnings. And living there allows them to retain a unique connection to the past and to benefit from the powers of blessing and protection that the sacred mountains provide. The beastie in particular has been occupied by indigenous peoples for thousands of years and by the Diné since at least the 17th century. A 1984 study noted in addition to Diné homes, several sites of particular religious and, and cultural significance in the area, including the site of an important past ceremonial, a location where a rare material used in ceremonial practices was gathered, a 19th century battleground, and a group of ancient petroglyphs. Still, O'Keefe felt that she uh, shared a special, somewhat proprietary relationship with the area. In 1944, Chabot wrote Stieglitz describing the black place as Georgia's country. And in a 1941 essay, she noted that O'Keefe called it my black place. O'Keefe remarked in her memoir that it was, quote, such a beautiful, untouched, lonely feeling place, part of what I call the far away, unquote. In her many vivid written descriptions of its desolate beauty, and in her insistence on incorporating the area into her own language for New Mexico, with terms like the far away and the black place, in lieu of Diné derived names like Beastie and Denazin, O'Keefe incorporated the site into her highly personal understanding of New Mexico. When she completed a pair of paintings of the site from memory in 1949, she distorted its colors red and green, further incorporating it into that personal language. Art historian Barbara Lines has pointed out how, though O'Keeffe's paintings of the Badlands from the early 1940s were, quote, a relatively faithful record of what can be seen at the site, later in the 1940s, she increasingly used them as a framework for abstraction, often making V and zigzag shapes the dominant elements in her compositions, unquote. If it was, as Guzman suggests, not truly hers, one would never know it from her paintings. Even more striking is the relationship that O'Keefe felt she shared with Cerro Pedernal, known as uh, Siping in local Indian languages, a large mesa that overlooks the valley in which Abiquiu and Ghost Ranch both sit. Starting in 1936, she made dozens of pictures of the mountain, works that typically show it either looming above the valley or alongside floating monumentalized bones or flowers. In addition to admiring and painting the mesa from her homes below, she sometimes hiked on it, picking flowers or taking in the view. As with the Black Place, O'Keefe described her relationship with Pei Darnal in terms of possession. In 1973, she stated that, quote, that is my private mountain. It belongs to me. God told me if I painted it enough, I could have it, unquote. In 1937, she painted the mountain behind her ghost ranch home in a painting called The House I Live In. In 1941, she titled a picture of the mountain in the valley below, My Front Yard. In 1943, Oki, uh, Chabot called it Her Mountain. And in 1949, her friend Vernon Hunter agreed, calling it Your Pater Now. Scholars have argued that its association with O'Keefe made it among the most recognized landforms in the world. Near the end of her life, the US government considered renaming the Mesa O'Keefe Mountain, though she rejected the idea after a public outcry. After her death in 1986, her ashes were scattered on its summit. Though it is popularly associated with O'Keefe, Cerro Pedernal is also a site of great significance to several native groups. Writes one historian, quote, it has become sacred ground to several tribes. Like all of the region of Abiquiu, Pedernal is part of the ancestral lands of the Tewa, who have certain ceremonial sites on its side, unquote. Some believe that a key figure in the Diné creation story Changing Woman was found there, and it also figures prominently in the Hikaria Apache origin tale. Artifacts from 7000 BCE have been discovered there, and its rock has likely been used by native groups far and wide for at least 10,000 years. However, there is no hint of these historical and cultural significances in O'Keeffe's depopulated mystical landscapes. In an early 1940s letter, she suggested that, quote, my world here is a world almost untouched by man. From 1982, I have seen this extraordinary country before anyone was living in it. Indeed, her approach towards New Mexico, uh, towards northern New Mexico, indicates that she felt that the region was an empty virgin land that she could not only evoke as no previous artist could, but that was also physically and spiritually available to her to discover and interpret to her own ends. As scholar Patricia Merrick and Norby points out, O'Keefe emphasized the region's supposed wonderful emptiness in interviews as well, 
and that interpretation, quote, conveniently omitted centuries of local people's presence, histories, and perspectives. As it fetishized, as Anglo visitors had for decades, the area's rusticity and underdevelopment. Though it often goes unmentioned in interpretations of her work, O'Keeffe's consistent effort to conjure the sense of certain places, and especially northern New Mexico, without representing the people who lived there or the encroachments of modernity happening there, frequently lends her pictures a sort of timelessness, an ethereal character that, appealing though it may be to many, also effaces people and perspectives that fail to jive with her own. Indeed, these other perspectives seem to have been beside the point. This approach echoes what art historian Albert Boyne called the magisterial gaze in American landscape painting, whereby white settler artists and writers erased indigenous presence by painting the land as open and available for exploration and use, often from the perspective of a grand vista. Though the Beastie Badlands and Cerro Pater now were not densely crowded places when O'Keeffe visited them, from the evidence of her pictures, we would never know of the hogans or trading posts she passed by as she moved through Diné land to the Black Place, or the abacue buildings that she looked over as she gazed at Pedar now, let alone the region's native people's long histories with these places. In her vision, these sites are untouched, serene, ever available for the consumption of the Anglo visitor. To be clear, it seems all but certain that O'Keeffe chose to paint the Black Place and Cerro Pedernal again and again, principally for aesthetic and personal reasons, as she, sir, her, uh, she herself suggested. However, we might justifiably wonder whether part of the appeal of these paintings uh, was their construction of a world that seemed peaceful and beautiful to white viewers. Likewise, part of these works' appeal was the sense that they seemed inherently spiritual, not just because O'Keeffe found them beautiful or visually interesting, but because of her feeling that they, like virtually all of New Mexico, had a special spiritual meaning as well, a spirituality that she perceived, at least in part, because of a hazy notion, uh, notion of a connection between land and religion among Hispanic and indigenous groups in the region. However, hers was an imprecise, distinctively Anglo understanding of the spiritual significance of the land, rather than an acknowledgement of native beliefs in the animate power of the natural world or a recognition of the spiritual significances of particular sites like Pedarnau or the BC area. We know relatively little about if or when O'Keeffe learned about the religious and cultural significance of the New, Mex New Mexican sites that she pictured. Regardless, it seems clear that she was able to walk the tightrope of seeing the region simultaneously as deeply informed by the presence and history of its non-white peoples and as open, empty, and ripe for the claiming as so many others had before. Ultimately, when she turned the Beastie Badlands into Georgia's country, or Cerro Pedernal into her private mountain, she became, in a sense, just another settler, dissolving indigenous sovereignty and agency to her own ends. It seems likely that the reason why O'Keeffe so often featured places and things of religious significance to Hispanic and indigenous communities in her work is that she felt that they had a foreign spiritual power. However, if channeling that spiritual feeling through the lens of indigenous and Hispanic related objects and sites was key to her own understanding of the Southwest, it was also fundamental to the way in which she conveyed that sense of place in her pictures. Whether they included obvious markers of local religious traditions like Katsina Titu or crosses or not, virtually all of her New Mexican paintings rely upon the invocation of a mysticism that was fundamentally tied to the supposedly exotic character of the state's non-white peoples and that deeply informed perceptions of the region from Taos to Manhattan. What this attitude toward New Mexico reinforced, however, was an outlook that was not only informed by, but also replicated and encouraged, and still replicates and encourages, a white gaze that was both shaped by and still perpetuates settler colonialism in northern New Mexico. Anthropologist Barbara Babcock offers a reminder that, quote, a colonialist gaze requires representations to reiterate its control, unquote. Sylvia Rodriguez adds that, quote, mystification is a process which perpetuates the social order by suffusing it with a shared sense of awesome transcendent meaning, unquote. Writes Daniel Francis, quote, by appropriating elements of native culture, non-natives have tried to reestablish a relationship with the country that predates their arrival and validates their occupation of the land, unquote. In O'Keeffe's assertions of possession and ownership, over not just sites like the Beastie Badlands and Cerro Pedar now, but the portion of northern New Mexico now often labeled O'Keeffe country more generally, 
She demonstrated a feeling of mastery over that land that was typical of the Anglo-New Mexican community of which she was a part. O'Keefe began to contribute to the broader American current of romanticization of the Southwest almost as soon as she displayed her first canvases of the area in New York in early 1930. Even these earliest paintings offered an implicit narrative about her exploration of the region's exotic climes and cultures, and the myth of O'Keeffe as a reclusive, mystical, and wise denizen and interpreter of the New Mexican high desert, what some have called the Sage of Abiquiu, began to take hold even in the 1930s, well before she moved there permanently in 1949. As O'Keeffe morphed into perhaps the nation's best known artist, the connection that she supposedly shared with the area came to be celebrated more frequently in Oberlin. By 1976, a Newsweek article could apparently be entitled O'Keeffe Country without a second thought. In these bits of evidence, we see the success of her efforts to claim the region for her own. The, the thousands of tourists who visit Santa Fe, Taos, and Abiquiu to consume the O'Keeffe legend today are proof that her paintings continue to do the work of colonialism by encouraging those visitors to occupy the Southwest as they were a uh, rebel in its exotic mystery. Though the reductive, romantic attitudes towards the region that her work encouraged were also celebrated by many others long before and after her tenure there, we might well wonder what the region might look like now had O'Keeffe never traveled there. Ultimately, the singular power of her work in shaping Santa Fe, Taos, and Abiquiu into the tourist centers they are today, where her work and that of other white artists are a central attraction, engagement with local indigenous and Hispanic cultures and communities often exists on a reductive and romantic plane that echoes her own, and the wants and needs of those non-Anglo communities often re uh, remain secondary concerns. That impact is undeniable. However, that her images still serve as such a powerful colonialist force is more a testament to the unusual subtlety and seductiveness of her pictures and the attitudes they convey, as well as the remarkable endurance of the notion that they reflected harmless uh, messages than the unusualness within her time and social environment of the ideologies towards Hispanic and indigenous cultures that they reinforce. In that sense, O'Keeffe's work was utterly typical. Thank you. Happy to take questions from anyone. Yes. Um, I think uh, I mentioned that briefly, yes. So, seven acres. Well, seven and a half acres, ultimately. First, the oh. Arthur Pack, and then the Presbyterians have had it since then. Yeah, I mean, she, she owned a part of it. Yeah. To be clear, Ghost Ranch is larger. 21,000 yeah. acres, and she had seven acres. Yes. It was 30,000 given by the king and the right. Land grab. Land grab. So, we have spent more than 20 years there, so I just had to question. Yeah, I wasn't trying to dispute that. Thank you. But more. Sure. We, when we've been there, we see her as someone who values the ranch in that area, that, that land area, as we imagine the Native Americans and the Hispanic people did for 500 years before the Anglos came in there. And there's always an interest maybe in building condominiums or changing it, and we see her more as a conservationist. She would picture what has been there for eons and what she would still like it to be. You know, I feel that the Pater Doll is my mountain or those Red Hills are mine too. I've been there, you know, it's it's our magic place. It's a thin place. And, in theological understanding where you may be closer to the divine and and yet the the the, uh, the material also is in communication it's a great spot it's been a great conference center spiritual the people who seem to come there as so O'Keefe apostles if you will um are, they revere the place in the same way they don't imagine it being colonialized or changed you know so it's just it's just a different understanding of we just understand we first went there in 68. She was first there in 29. We were very impressed with, with it at that time. It was very poor in that time. The casinos had not come in. The Native Americans lived along the roads between Santa Fe 
and uh, in Albuquerque and, and on up to Abiquiu. And then the casino money came in. I'm sure a lot of it went to gaming companies, but some of that got schools and improved the Native American. Uh, and what we liked about it was that the Pueblo people had a, a lifestyle that the Spanish had been able to understand, and they tolerated them. They used other northern New Mexico communities to be a barrier for the Plains Indians coming in and interfering with the Spanish colonial area. But it just, we have an understanding that somehow the Native Americans and, and we Anglos and the, uh, the Hispanic culture is as close to understanding a state as anywhere we've been. So that's all. Yeah. I, I would say yes. you are totally disregarding the Native Americans and what they were doing long before with people. But it's a totally disregarding. It's a two way street. Well, it, they're they're very close. they were there first. Right, but they're very close. They yeah, I think. The lesson line, understanding that. Yeah, one thing I'll say is that um, O'Keefe has had such a powerful um, impact on this part of the world and its history um, that it's a little hard to sort of um, engage in a counterfactual about what would have happened if she had never been there. Um, and uh, with that being said, you know, her legacy there in terms of, you know, impact on the community is quite mixed. Um, there's a lot of resentment in Abiquiu of O'Keefe and the crowds that continue to visit there um, because of her history there. Uh, she was in some ways a um, philanthropic figure within the poor town of Abiquiu. As you mentioned, she had some environmentalist uh, leanings, um, even though she, she was not a, a committed environmentalist. Um, so, um, you know, we could, we could engage in a thought experiment about what this part of the world might've been like without her. And I suppose I'm more interested in what did happen. Um, so I don't want to, you know, rehearse a whole, um, I, I don't want to have a big argument about um, this, but I welcome more questions about, uh, you know, what I did say in my paper. Catherine? Thank you. Um, I was curious what you were starting to mention at the end about the drug joke museum. Has there been an impulse to integrate also the that you presented at the beginning, is that kind of information also within the exhibit or like that photograph where she's wearing the blanket? Is there like text and captioning provided to help viewers like engage with that larger romanticization? Um, no, um, not, not at all. Um, uh, I, you know, I have, well, you know, I think, um, I um, was last there a couple of years ago, and I think that it was it was a relatively recent revelation for the people at the museum that they should be thinking more about indigenous um, rights or histories and how O'Keeffe's work might connect to that and how that might connect to their work at the museum. So I think that um, they are still, in, um, they are a little more aware of that than they used to be even 10 years ago, but they haven't really changed, to my knowledge, the. Um, way that they're presenting these works. They're still, for example, quite recently, they've still been um, presenting the representations of Katsina T2 that many people feel that they should not be showing. Um, so um, they are definitely, I would say, more so uh, oriented towards serving the needs of tourists than um, indigenous people or, or any others. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure about that. His, the, the name of the Harvey company was named after Fred Harvey. Um, so I don't know if he would have had any connection to this other man. I'm sorry. Yes. There is um, uh, an impulse within the Native community at this point in time to be more aware of them. They have gone to Ghost Ranch and have questioned Ghost Ranch regarding their artifacts in their archaeological museum. And uh, I know that changes have been made and will continue to be made with that conversation, which is a good thing, right? Any other questions I can answer? <laughs> 
Uh, yes, in the in the third row there. Well, um, I guess as uh, Jennifer mentioned at the beginning, this is part of my dissertation project. So it's part of a larger um, thing that I've been working on for a long time. I think that um, my um, interest in this sort of topic more generally was um, grounded in a gripe that I had with past generations of scholarship, um, which um, I think was uh, to give a brief historiographical sort of uh, lesson, like uh, there was a long history of um, American art scholarship that was really celebratory. And part of that is because there was a longstanding perception before that, that American art was derivative, unimportant, um, second rate in comparison to European art. And so there came to be a lot of scholarship that was very celebratory. That also has to do with the connections between museums and um, art history scholarship. Um, but I guess that was my original interest was in trying to um, think about the um, connections between modern American art and systems of bias and oppression in America in a way that I felt past generations of scholars hadn't. Yes. So that was my first part of my question as well, how you came to explore this. And you, and so are you looking at maybe future look at other scholars, I mean, other artists who have also fallen into this area of what's the truth behind the, the beauty? Yeah, well, you know, um, I guess, you know, I could mention um, this, as I was saying, this isn't the only artist that I have researched um, while in graduate school. These are some of the other artists that were part of the same group under Stieglitz's um, protection or, you know, he was promoting them and they were sort of uh, part of a coherent group together. So that was the thrust of the research that I've already done. But I do hope, you know, that um, other scholars become interested in this sort of thing. I think that in some ways it's part of a growing uh, wave within um, or a, a reconsideration of what American art historical scholarship can be in this moment that's being driven by uh, younger scholars. Um, so I hope that um, I'll be able to pursue sort of similar scholarship about some others in the future. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, in that case, I'll just say thank you. Um, if you're one of my students, make sure you come up here so that I can note that you were here, okay? All right, thank you.